What Outlander finally gets right about rape this season? Outlander has a history of using rape and assault to move the plot forward, but the way we see Brianna deal with hers is a breakthrough for the show. Readers of the Outlander books had whispered it was coming this season, and then it happened, Brianna, daughter of Jamie and Claire, was brutally attacked by new villain Stephen Bonnet. It happens after Brianna spots Claire's wedding ring from Jamie, a notable change from the books, on Bonnet's gambling table and tries to haggle with him for it. Bonnet isn't in the mood, he thinks all things are his for the taking. So he rapes her in a back room of the tavern, while a room full of men sit outside and ignore her screams. And laugh. And drink. And even neatly place Brianna's boots which Bonnet ripped off her feet and cast aside, beside the door as if she were a house guest. The scene reminded me of Christine Blasey Ford's devastating testimony on Capitol Hill, when she told the Senate Judiciary Committee the one thing she will never forget about the night at that party with Brett Kavanaugh, indelible dot is the laughter, the uproarious laughter between the two. I was underneath one of them while the two laughed. There is a belief that rape equals penetration, Kilburn says. If it isn't penetration, it isn't rape, and therefore it doesn't matter. It's another moment when the 18th century storyline feels shockingly relevant in 2019, and it's a turning point in the season. Yes, the show is known for its hot consensual sex between Jamie and Claire, but the plot is often driven forward by rape and sexual assault. There's Jamie's torture and rape by Jack Randall at Wentworth Prison. There's the off-camera rape of Fergus, again by Randall, at a brothel in Paris. The drugging and rape of young Ian by the Bakra, also known as Guy Isles Duncan, after she steps out of a pool of blood. All men, all raped, and these male characters get to process and deal with their assaults, Jamie most of all. Most male rape victims don't talk about it, says Jean Kilburn, creator of the Killing Us Softly film series, media critic and feminist activist who has studied how women are portrayed in advertising and media. They have to be encouraged to come forward, the shame and stigma is so deep. Kilburn says Jamie's reaction, how he doesn't just shrug off the trauma and isn't healed immediately, is the most accurate portrayal of real life. We see him grapple with depression and suicide. Importantly, Claire doesn't shun him or tell him everything's fine. Instead she uses varying tactics to get him to open up about the trauma. We've barely even talked about it, she says during a fight one night in Paris. Tell me, goddamn it. Talk to me, make me understand. Once Jamie does, the couple take a major step toward healing. In season 2, Fergus also finds some solace in confiding to Claire, who emphasizes the rape was not his fault. In season 4, when Ian has a flashback about his assault that triggers a panic attack, it's Jamie who counsels him. And in the process debunks a myth about male rape as he explains to Ian that it's possible to have an erection and still be against a man's will, you have a conscience, your cock does not. Kilburn can't recall a similar scene between two men on screen. People understand that a man can be anally penetrated, says Kilburn. But if he has an erection, they think. Doesn't that mean it was consensual? It's hard for people to imagine. These are breakthrough moments, but Claire has never found this kind of support. After nearly being raped by Jack Randall after she goes through the stones, Claire has no time to cope, she keeps running. When English officers interrupt Jamie and Claire's tryst in the glade, the haze of the attack leaving viewers unsure of the severity of the assault, Claire goes into shock but it seems to be more about the blood on her hands from killing the officer than her own violation. Next she's assaulted by Randall again, dressed or in open, his knife threatening to cut off her nipple. Jamie comes to her aid, but afterward there is no discussion of what happened. The scenes are a subtle reminder of what our culture says to women about assault. It's nothing. Brush yourself off and move on. It wasn't really rape. Kilburn suggests there are a few reasons the story has played out this way. There is a belief that rape equals penetration, Kilburn says. If it isn't penetration, it isn't rape, and therefore it doesn't matter. We saw this play out in Blasey Ford's testimony. People would comment, he didn't rape her, so what's the big deal? Why is she bringing this up now? But Kilburn also sees something of a Bechdel test when rape is used as a storyline, 
Who can a woman depend on after an assault? Does Claire have a female friend? She points out. By and large Claire does does not. Mrs. Fitzgibbons isn't someone she can trust enough upon arrival at Castle Lock. There's the hope of friendship with Guy Isles, but that idea unravels faster than Father Wakefield rushes to burn a witch at the stake. In Paris, Louise is mostly preoccupied by gossip, though she does redeem herself when Faith is stillborn. And this season Adoy is brutally murdered just as her relationship with Claire begins to blossom. Notably, when Mary Hawkins was raped, Claire is a friend she can turn to, offering medical care and comfort in telling Mary, it's not your fault. Which brings us back to this season's story arc. Brianna, immediately after the rape, does have someone to turn to, her new maid Lizzie immediately offers aid. But despite her torn dress in bloody petticoats and bruises, Brianna refuses to speak of the trauma. You have my hand here, and my ear if you need it, Lizzie persists. Like so many women who delay telling anyone about an assault, Brianna doesn't reveal what happened, not until she learns she's pregnant and finally tells Claire. That's two people in her corner. And once Claire shares the story with Jamie, Brianna has a third ally. You have my hand here, and my ear if you need it, Brianna's maid, Lizzie, says immediately after the assault. This week, in a heart-to-heart -heart with her father, Brianna suggests she could have prevented the attack, I could have fought. I could have tried harder. Jamie, in turn, gives voice to the words that make every survivor hesitate to come forward. You're right, you could have. Unless of course you wanted it, he says. I'm thinking you're maybe playing with the truth a bit, lass. Maybe it wasn't rape at all. Maybe you took a liking to the lad, and made the story up after. Maybe you enjoyed it. It's enough to enrage Brianna, who tries to strike him, until Jamie grabs her by the neck and viscerally shows how she couldn't have stopped Bonnet and survived. Do you think yourself a coward because you couldn't fight off a wolf with your bare hands? Jamie says. It took courage not to fight. If you did he would have killed you. The scene doesn't end there. Did you fight back, against Jack Randall? Brianna asks. And laid bare there is what hurts most, the shame. I gave my word not to fight, for your mother's life, Jamie replies. I would do the same again. Says Kilburn, men here all the time, why didn't you fight back? Rape is about power, physical and psychological, she reminds. Randall gets off on his power over Jamie. Bonnet shows his upper hand when he pays Brianna with her mother's ring. Put another way, says Kilburn, they each pull off a total mind fuck. With only two episodes left in the season, there are hints that Roger, once he's reunited with Brianna, will also line up in her corner, though perhaps not right away if the child is not his. But Brianna is finally a female character who will be given the time and support she needs to heal. It's useful to have a show like this illustrate these issues, even if they don't get it entirely right, says Kilburn. We need to see that men can be raped. That it's important to talk about rape. That assault, of all kinds, can have lasting effects. It helps break down the mythology of it all. And most of all, episodes like these are a reminder to all of us to be a friend. To be there unconditionally when a survivor is ready to open up. To listen. To believe.